We are live. Good. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Boone Community School District School Board Directors meeting. Uh, we'll start the meeting with roll call vote. Weber. Here. Nystrom. Here. Tevin. Here. Pritchard. Here. Melhouse. Here. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, recognition of visitors. I'm sitting in the lobby here and I see no visitors. Uh, as I look through, I don't see any visitors uh, that are signed in here. So we're gonna move on to consideration of the agenda. Uh, Mrs. Tripa, is there any changes in the uh, agenda? No, there's no changes in the agenda. Okay, hearing that there are no changes in the agenda, <coughs> I would uh, entertain a motion for approval of the agenda as published. I move to approve the agenda. Second. Dr. Nyström moved to approve. Uh, Ms. Stephen second the approve the agenda as printed. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, now we're gonna go to hearing for delegations. Again, I don't see anyone here. Uh, Bog, is there anyone online that has put any early comments or anything? No, not yet. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the routine business and I entertain a motion for approval of the routine business. Motion to approve routine business. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved by Mr. Weber, seconded by Mrs. Teban to approve the routine business. Is there anything that any board member would like to extract? I don't believe there are any unity point or Pritchard bills this month. I did check that. There is nothing. Yeah, there's nothing. Go ahead, Pat. Did you have something you want to extract? No, I said I already checked. There is nothing. Okay. Can I ask that everyone here in the room mute unless you're going to say something because we're getting a little bit of feedback here. So. Okay. Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor of approving the routine business as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Aye. Okay, motion passes unanimously to approve the routine business. Next, uh, we have the professional development plan and uh, Mrs. Steven and Mrs. James, I'm gonna assume that you two are in charge of this. Yes, so the professional development uh, draft schedule is presented here. Um, our major themes for 2021 or our focus is social emotional learning with an equity lens um, and follow up from our discussion at our last board meeting. Um, we wanna make sure that we're addressing that equity, but also through that lens of social emotional learning you know, as a broader piece that we know we wanna support with all of our students and in our teachers learning to address both of those. Um, we will continue to implement professional learning communities um, with some type of collaboration, regardless of format, that has continued to be a theme of ours that we wanna to continue to put an emphasis and a focus on um, with those collaborative teams, um, adjusting their instruction to make database decision-making or database decisions um, to best meet individual students' learning. We'll continue to implement um, multi-tier systems of support with a focus on that universal instruction. And you'll see themes throughout um, the draft schedule here of some of those pieces that we began our work um, last in the last year or two on in literacy and some other um, content areas. And we wanna continue that 
support of universal instruction in those areas, as well as ways to improve on our effective intervention processes and ways that we um, respond to data. And then um, our focus continues to be on expanding family and community engagement. And that uh, pairs really well with our social emotional learning and equity. Um, the first four days of school or of back to school learning the, the draft schedule there uh, for professional development, you can see is pretty big compared to what it might be typically at this time. Um, we know what the big ideas are that we wanna support and, and we want staff to know that and you know, we plan on the first two days being um, all certified staff and they'll be in their buildings and working through um, any building level work, but we really wanna be able to be responsive to whatever our return to learn planning needs are and whatever's most important um, with our return planning at that point. So they'll be in their buildings for those first two days with um, time to work through some details at the building level and classroom prep. Um, and then um, this last two days, um, the Thursday and Friday of, of the four days of professional development before school starts, we welcome all of our certified and support staff back. So we'll be doing some all district work at that time. Um, and again, a lot of that is focused on what do we need to do to get back to school um, after being out for a bit. So specific times will be coming as we iron some of those things out. But um, at this point, that's kind of the, the thought process that we wanna make sure we can support a lot of building level, um, give a lot of building level time to our teachers so they have the time and our, our support staff to get settled back in um, and take care of their own social emotional needs. And then also have some time to, to support everybody at a whole district level. Then as we move down to the rest of the school year, um, that, that's a little bit more in place in that we have some speakers coming in, um, some um, consultants that we've partnered with to support our teachers in um, working with um, students from that social emotional lens, working with students um, and challenging behaviors and giving our special ed teachers some additional support. And then also um, some additional support in literacy. Um, we have some new materials that we're implementing at PK uh, through two. And uh, so we wanna make sure that those teachers have the support they need to implement that comprehension toolkit. And then um, we have uh, teachers at third and fourth grade who began that implementation work last year and really wanna take a little bit deeper dive. So we have a consultant that will continue to work with them for a second year and support them in that literacy learning. Um, and then um, other themes that run throughout is time for the buildings to um, dedicate to collaborative time. Those PLC meetings, we hear all the time from our teachers that the weekly time is great, but when they have an extended couple hours on a full day of professional development to really dive in as a team to do some unit planning or to review data or create assessments, they really value that time. So trying to reserve that for them um, based on their feedback. And then also plenty of building level time so that the buildings can respond as necessary. High school has that time to work on um, supporting teachers with standards reference grading. Middle school is doing some more work with assessment and um, responding to their assessment data and formative assessments. And so they'll have the time to support their buildings in those areas on those full days as well. Julie, anything to add to that? No, I think that what we want to keep in mind is we want to be flexible enough to um, provide for our teachers' needs as the needs change. But obviously, the social emotional piece will remain a high priority regardless of the format that we end up using. But um, we did purposely give you a skeletal um, look at the PD simply because we want to make sure that we are addressing the needs of our teachers in that survey that we sent out to teachers and follow-up surveys will also help us plan for those um, professional development days. Brian, this is Pam. Yes. At, at two or three meetings ago, we discussed the possibility of providing teachers with some additional instruction on distance learning techniques, et cetera, and you know paying seat time whatever it you know was going to look like where did that end up jill um we have or well we plan to convene our tq committee uh this summer to see if they're uh if the committee can approve some additional hours typically we do um, additional project hours for things like that in the fall and, and they begin those projects in October. We'd like to offer the teachers the opportunity to begin some of that work during the summer and we know several are doing um, or have signed up to do several things like um, a distance learning class. I know several are taking that right now with an instructional coach at the high school. I know several have signed up to take various <coughs> and the opportunity to 
do that and have that um, be recognized as a TQ project that they could start work on in the summer or continue into the fall if that fits their needs better. Yeah, because I think there are people out there who probably would, would like that to be more confident in case, you know, distance learning continues. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions from board members? Hearing no further questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve the professional development preliminary plan as presented to the board. I'd move to approve the professional development plan as written. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> it's been moved by Mr. Pritchard and seconded by Mr. Weber to approve the professional development plan preliminary as present to the board. Any other questions? Hearing no further questions, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. <clears throat> okay. The motion passes unanimously. Building handbooks. <clears throat> We've got a lot of handbooks here and a lot of things on the agenda. So I'm gonna let um, each superintendent or each principal gets two minutes, two minutes to highlight what the changes are. And two minutes only. And we'll start from the high school since the high school ones are li listed on top. Mr. Byam or Mr. Drake? Or Mr. Bailey. All right, I'm just uh, bringing mine up. So um, obviously, uh, with a lot of the changes that have been uh, going on, uh, we we started off uh, with our COVID-19 statement um, that there could be adjustments uh, according to where we are with um, CDC policies and things like that. Um, one of the things that we've had over the last few years um, in social events, um, we had, we'd like to cap it. Um, we've had some people that are above the age of 21 that has been, that have been coming to dances and we'd like to cap that at 20 years old. Um, we would like to also have our guests uh, show their IDs uh, and their driver's license uh, just for safety precaution measure, measures. Um, Students must serve their prior consequences, so the detentions, um, that's something we've been doing, um, but we just want to make sure that it's listed so everybody is aware of it. We make sure that we announce it with plenty of time prior, uh, prior to any dances. Um, <clears throat> we added some basic information when it came to standard reference grading, and um, we have a linked uh, SRG handbook um, that we're creating and finishing up. Um, so we'll be continuing to, to work on that to share out with families and, and uh, give that uh, communication to our families. Um, we added some tier one and tier two supports when it came to absences. Uh, Mr. Bailey uh, worked extremely hard this year on the unexcused absences and the unexcused tardies. And so just defining it a little bit clear. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is also headwear. Um, we, it's one of those things where um, we're not having um, a lot of issues when it comes to uh, within classes. Um, teachers are pretty flexible with what's going on. And so um, we just feel that in the hallways uh, during passing time, it's not a place to necessarily fight it. But when they walk into a classroom, we'd like to have them remove those, um, remove their hats. Obviously, uh, any advertisements, uh, alcohol, beer, drugs, tobacco products would be prohibited. Um, in addition of wearing clothing that are sexually suggestive or is derogatory direct, uh, directed to individuals or groups on a basis of race, religion, creed, color, national origin, uh, disability, gender, and or and the age is uh, prohibited. And then um, the graduation requirements needed to be updated just based on what we passed last year. Okay, thank you, Mr. Byam. One quick question I do have is that dance age 20 or 21, 
we had the, a big debate about this. I think we spent 20 or 30 minutes at a board meeting about, I know, two, three, four years ago. I think it was Kirk Leeds was still president at the time, so it's been at least four years ago. That's correct. But when we made the decision, was that a handbook decision or was that a policy decision? I believe at it which was. Which level was that? I believe it's a handbook uh, policy. I don't think it was, I don't think it's a board policy. Yeah, Trey, I could not remember for. Remember? So I try to go through, I don't believe it is. If it's a policy change, I try to add it under the category section. So like headwear and graduation requirements are policy changes, but I don't think social events was. And I think okay. uh, we, we made that change and we had a 29 year old, a 23 year old, a 24 year old, a 25 year old, and I think another 23 year old that prom. I just don't think it's in the best interest of our students to have anybody that's over the age of 20 at one of our dances. Yes. Okay. I have a quick question. Yes, sir. Um, in the headwear, and this may be even falling under just clothing in general <clears throat> in the next few weeks or in the next year. Mm -hmm. um, as I read it, you know, it's in addition, the wearing of clothing that is sexually suggestive or is derogatory directed to individuals or groups on the basis of race, religion, creed, color, you know, you, you know, you just read it. Um, where would the Confederate flag fall out in that with all everything going on in the world around us right now? I would love your input on that. <laughs> but that's a great okay. question. Any anyone else right now, it doesn't belong. You guys know, right? Yeah, I know you know what I think. Like, so does anyone else have any thoughts? I would go down, I would go down the line that it doesn't belong. I have a question. This is Pam. Okay, a lot of kids have Black Lives Matter t-shirts. Where you know that I I think it's okay. That's my personal feeling. But what if it causes a substantial disruption in the education environment? And that's usually the test. And that's where it ends up changing. Is when the other disruption. You gotta look there too. Is that we have a lot of police officers who have kids in this school district too. Correct. Are they gonna be offended? And then if you read the rules. It said to be a, not to be offensive to others. The Black Lives Matter T-shirt might become offensive to them. So this is going to be a um, ticklish situation all fall. I think it's just as much at a national level as it's going to be at our local school level. I would just say one of the things um, as we go to mandatory masks, we may have some kids that a lot of the nurses at the hospital and even myself. We'll wear a type of a hat or a um, scarf that has button sewn arms because so their ears don't get irritated and rubbed through a long day. And I don't have my mask on tonight just because I'm running this meeting. Most of you might not be able to hear me if I don't. There's also no one within six feet of me. Um, we may have to look at something there too. And that's kind of why we went with the flexibility in the hat policy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I honestly, it's something that I don't necessarily feel that we need to battle. And I would, I did do a poll a few years ago from our staff that that was something that they agreed with too. Um, so I'm fine at making any edits or changes that you guys would like to recommend. Um, I think that also goes with, I mean, we could, accept it this way and with our COVID policy, um, do kind of a COVID handbook um, when we decide our hybrid online and everything that we're gonna be sharing with our, and, and any particular policies that we need to address, that might be something that we could address within a, within a handbook that could be approved in August, at the beginning of August, if you want. Yeah, I think unfortunately it comes down to almost a case by case situation. Um, and, and I'd love to hear Julie's thoughts on this as well too. Um, but we could we could run this all the way down the road of like, you know, yeah, Black Lives Matters and Confederate flags and pride flags and Christians 
reading their Bible, you know, like it can go so far down this line. Um, I think it's situational in the fact of like, if a kid is just wearing a Black Lives Matter shirt and walking through the school, I don't have an issue with that. But if he's standing on the table screaming at people trying to get in a fight about it and saying with the Confederate flag, I don't, I don't think there's a place for it. I don't agree with it. But if someone is just wearing it and, and staying out of trouble and not causing problems, then it's, then it's more acceptable. But, but yeah, like I just, cause it's going to be never ending. And I've seen it already in the community already on social media. Mm -hmm. You, you pull one thing out and then we pull 12 more things out so well, yeah. I think I think honestly one of the things that we've done a really good job of at the high school and and we try to work on this is um, valuing the uniqueness of all um, I think we we talk about that we talk about the Toreador way we talk about how to treat one another each day um, I know that I've had students wearing a confederate flag I had a, a walkout a couple of years ago, well, the responding group also did a walkout and everybody was respectful. And I think one of the things that we need to continue to teach our students is to how appropriately protest or appropriately get their message across. And it, it's about teaching. It's not about um, accusatory. It's not about attacking. It's about listening to other people's viewpoints and everybody's, that's one of the things that we as a country should be proud of is that we have that opportunity to do that. And I come from a family that <clears throat> came from a communist country and they didn't have that opportunity. So um, I think we, we genuinely have those discussions with our students. Um, is it, can it be a hot top, topic? Absolutely. Um, can it be offensive in some cases? Absolutely. Um, but it's our responsibility to make sure that we're teaching appropriate um ways of of sending those messages yeah thank you one mm -hmm. last quick question is and this goes on all the handbooks the adult visitors welcome policy i think we need to look at that one mainly in the face of the covid um because right now we don't want a whole lot of extra people in this building or at any level because of it so I don't know if we change it in every one of the handbooks or if we just have that in our COVID handbook. And if someone asks the question, we say, sorry, but the special COVID handbook overrules the individual school's handbook. So Ms. Trepa, I'm neutral on so, that. Yeah, so I think that we need to have it under a COVID handbook, kind of what Chris was talking about with regard to a lot of these things. I don't wanna go and change our handbooks to match that because I'm hoping that that's not a permanent, you know, COVID's not a permanent situation for us. So I think anything that would deviate from our current handbooks to accommodate COVID related um, procedures needs to go into COVID handbook would be my opinion. Okay, any other board questions? Hearing none, I'm going to go to Mr. Kelly. You get your two minute opening statement. All right, mine will be pretty quick. Uh, we didn't have a lot of changes in the handbook. So, um, updated our new staff um, under our exploratories. Um, we added guidance back in. So, we had gone away from that last year. So, this next year, hopefully, um, if things go well, um, we're planning on adding guidance back at the fifth and sixth grade levels. Um, updated lunch prices, um, fixed the grammar errors that Google Docs let me know about, um, and uh, added some things to help out the nurse. We added some leaving the building. Um, we tend to have people show up every once in a while and disappear without checking out, or somebody calls and says, I'm coming to pick my kid up, they're sick, and the nurse doesn't know about it. So we're just trying to make sure that um, people are aware that for somebody to go home sick, it needs to go through the nurse and they need to let the nurse know that they're not feeling well. So the nurse can contact the parent so we know people are leaving. Um, so that was just to help out the nurse. Um, and then the rest of the stuff that I highlighted really just ties in with what we were just talking about. 
um, we were talking about, um, I highlighted stuff where um, food being dropped off for visitors or parents bringing lunch to the school, um, our arrival times, pickup departure times. Um, my thought with that was I was gonna high, I highlight it in the handbook and put an asterisk by it and just see say, see the COVID policy. So when we go back from it, we don't have to totally add it back in there. I can just unhighlight it. So um, the things that I highlighted to share were just those policies that I think will will adapt with COVID. So I'll highlight it, put an asterisk by it. Um, and then when we go back to normal, whenever that is, we can um, just fix that without having to take it out and put it back in. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, questions from the board members to Mr. Kelly. Couple of questions again, <laughs> sorry. Um, and maybe I just missed it in the handbook. I, I couldn't have access to the just changes doc. So I was trying to read through the whole thing. Are we still staggering the start and end times of fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth? Yep. Yes. Great. Um, and then I saw something in there. Maybe this wasn't a change. It's just something that popped up to me. Um, I saw something about high energy drinks. Um, is that new? No, that's always been in there. That's always kind of been one of those considerations where we tried to keep like, you know, I don't know. It, it's one of those things that's like impossible to police, um, you know, deter you from bringing monster energy drinks to lunch and stuff like that. But, um, you know, half of our kids show up in the morning with a coffee from scooters or somewhere like that. And they're, they're bringing drinks in and what they have in there, you know, now that we've kind of gone to allowing more water bottles and what they have in there, it's hard to police. Do you have, um, you know, monster energy drink? Do you have Gatorade? Do you have water? Um, I guess as long as it's not a problem or causing issues or, you know, something inappropriate. <clears throat> Um, we've kind of tried to discourage that based on lunchroom policy expectations of what's supposed to be available during lunch, um, you know, by uh, our gu guidelines for the lunch program. Um, but it's not something that we really, we just try and discourage it, but we don't make a big deal of it. Sounds good. I just saw it when it piqued my interest. I'll never forget Autumn telling me that they had to take Monster or something like that away from like a second grader. And I was just <laughs> <laughs> shocked. <laughs> when they bring it in, somebody had to buy it for them. So. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Any parents watching this right now, stop giving your children Monster <laughs> below the age of 16. Like it's bad. <laughs> Okay, next up would be the Paige Franklin. We're gonna give, we're gonna let Autumn give her three minute introduction. She gets three minutes because she's got the beef as well. So, in preschool, then we'll have questions and Brad's for last. I think there's five handbooks there. So you have the Paige and Lincoln one and my changes are exactly the same. So I don't need too much time. Um, Brad and I had revamped them last year and really updated our beliefs around social emotional and behavior so we didn't change anything in that we really appreciated the time to spend with it and address it so that parents got a better feel for our beliefs um so but same thing i highlighted our drop off and pick up when i had to have this completed i i still i don't know what that's going to look like and i appreciate that idea that we've spent a lot of time building kind of our dream what it looks like and if we get to go back to that soon i'd hate to revamp all of this so i really like scott idea scott's idea of putting an asterisk by it highlighting it and just saying you know see the the COVID handbook so we can do that um for sure so there's there's no big changes whatsoever in the page and lincoln handbook um beep there are are not any big changes except we had to add an, a child abduction statement um per our dhs evaluation so that's added it's just the generic how we respond statement um in, and i think it's in the it's in the beep parent handbook the beep employee handbook we've just added um a couple things about um trainings and required what's required before you start, what's required while you're doing it. They've changed the hours of continued learning um, to uh, 
increased a little bit. So we had to, we had to change that. Um, the handbook, I believe, in, includes the COVID handbook um, that you guys already have approved in the past, but we just had it attached still to it. Um, so that's in there. Preschool is the same. Um, we changed hours just a bit because um, we, we like to have the start and end time, the same with the start of the school day and the end of the school day for parents. So if they're picking up, um, they can grab both kiddos at the same time. Uh, we did that last year. We just had to change those times a little bit as we tweak times this year. Um, that looks the same. Uh, there are some preschool employee handbook changes um, that had to happen due to our desk audit that were just policies and procedures are already in place. We had to add a diapering one um, of how often we check the diapering space to make sure that it's safe. Um, and then I think there was another one about training and questions that was just something that was required by our desk got it. So otherwise everything is pretty much the same. Okay. And I think parent handbook for preschool is the same too, just times changed in that. Okay, sounds good. Thank you very much. I'll have questions from board members administration to autumn. <clears throat> Hearing no questions. I'd like to thank all the ministers for all the hard work and putting these together. Oh, we've got Brad. Sorry, Brad. It's all right. We need Franklin. I'll be quick. Uh, we did a kind of a complete overall of ours last year. So um, other than just going back through and uh, fixing a couple things with wording and adding the COVID statement, um, no changes for this year. Okay. Any questions for Brad? Okay. I'd like to thank all the ministers for their diligent work on getting these um, all out on time. Um, and for editing them for English. Um, we no longer have Mrs. Westrom on the board to take care of our English lessons for us. So appreciate that. Now, uh, hearing no further discussion, do I have a motion to approve all these? I'll take one motion for everything. This is Pat. I move to approve the handbooks. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved by Mrs. Teep and seconded by Dr. Nystrom to approve all the handbooks uh, and policies as presented on item 3.02. Any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor signal by saying aye. 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 <coughs> Nay. Motion passes unanimously. Next, we'll move on to the substitute pay. Uh, Mrs. Treble. So with the entering the school year and anticipating the need to have more guest teachers, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to re-examine our sub teacher pay to make sure that we are competitive with our neighbors in being able to attain guest teachers. Um, so you should have, uh, receive that document sh sharing um, the sub rate pays. And I believe last February is when the board last looked at this. So it should be fairly recent, but wanted to allow the board the opportunity to have a discussion to determine whether we feel comfortable with where our sub rate pay is, or if we feel that it's necessary to um, increase it at this time. This is Pam. And when uh, I uh, talked to Jeremy a little bit, or we communicated a little bit about the idea of maybe needing to up ours. I just went ahead and called around a little bit, said, you know, I'm Pam Nystrom from Boone. What's your sub pay going to be? And so I don't mean to step on any toes. And then I saw the list and I thought, oh, rats, I'm being naughty but districts are already upping and when i talked to ames they said they're talking about it at their board meeting tonight and they're going to go probably from 120 to 125 woodward granger is at 130 madrid's at 115 uh, 
Jefferson or Greene County is at 120. And United, I talked to their business manager. He said in during last school year, but I got the idea from him that it was after we were out of school. They went ahead and they changed theirs to 125. And so I think we're at 105. So we're probably at the bottom again, unless last year you raised it again. We're at 120 I, this year. We're at 120 this year because I had I didn't yes. sub last year. Okay, then we, I think we were 105, I believe, until this last yeah. spring. Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, that's what I thought. So I guess uh, that's pretty in the ballpark then, you know. I don't know what Ogden's was, but I figure with the same soup, it's probably about the same as United. And Ballard, I think last time, when we did that in January, February, I remember Dr. Menard saying that when he called the Ballard principal, or superintendent, the Ballard superintendent was a little bit upset with him because he discovered that they were low like us and we're gonna have to come up some. So I'm gonna guess they're up. Maybe it's too soon to say. I'm not sure if maybe this is something we need to look at in a month or two and see how we're doing on finding substitutes and also trying to get an update. Um, with, like Dr. Nystrom said, calling them to get the latest information. I'm not sure how dated this graph was, but um, I think at minimum, this is something that we need to closely follow in the next two to three months time and maybe have it been brought back to the board and let's say October. I do know, just so everyone's aware, I do know that we um, are already seeing a decrease in our available subs that we had utilized before. So um, we are looking at um, some creative ways to try and recruit substitute <coughs> teachers that we haven't been able to attain yet. So I think um, what you would hear from administration is they would have a desire to be as competitive as we possibly could be because we are aware of decreased availability already and we haven't started school yet. And it, you know, it tends to be one of those areas, even for five bucks being in the middle, we draw people that are willing to come over from Ames and Ogden and closer areas that, um, you know, I think it's one of those areas that it doesn't hurt you to be in the top because it draws in some more of those people. And I think we're going to, not only are we going to be short because some of the ones that we've utilized in the past have taken jobs this year, I think there might be some that we're still helping out that we know have had health issues that won't be coming back also. So I think anything we could do to entice subs to want to be here would be a good plan. Hey, Mitch, I'd recommend is there any that way? we follow along at least with what Ames is doing. And if they're going to 125, I think that would be prudent for us to do the same. Any, any way to uh, determine how much we spent on subs last year? And what, mm -hmm. say, a $10 increase would, would cost us out of the general fund? I just did it. It was about four or five grand more. We spent about 130 or so last year on subs. Well, I'd say we should On just a normal be, year. We should be 10 to $15 higher than whoever's highest in our conference. Give, give people the best, the most uh, reason to come to our district to, to hopefully uh, keep our kids in school as long as possible. Yeah. I agree with Jeremy. 130, 135. Like, I want to be the top. Like, <laughs> I mean, we're we're talking about ten thousand dollars to have the um, the best educational opportunities for our students. It seems like money well spent to me. Would any of you people like to put that into a motion? I'd move that we increase our sub pay to. What are we at right now? 120. Yes. To 135 dollars a day, um, knowing that we may need to be flexible depending on other districts' increases in the next month or two. <clears throat> okay, I have a motion to move our sub pay to 135 per day. Is there a second to that motion? Second. I see a second from Mr. Weber. It has been moved by Mr. Pritchard, seconded by Mr. Weber, to increase sub pay. From 120 to 135, which basically just a little bit over a 10% increase. Is there any further discussion on this motion?
Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Motion does pass. Next is our school board meeting schedule. <clears throat> Dr. Mrs. Treba. As far as the school board meeting schedules, I would recommend that you just continue with the schedule that you've had. So it maintains some consistency for our community members to know when our board meetings are. I wouldn't want to change them dramatically. So I would just recommend that we move forward with um, similar um, schedule as what you've done in the past. Okay, I will probably miss, I might miss the, the March 8th meeting, but I'm not sure what we're gonna be doing by then with spring break and COVID. We all might be still here. We all might be doing this from home. We might all have had vaccines and been back to normal and playing a normal spring break the following week. So I think that is something we can discuss in February if it comes to that point. Anyone else have any big problems with any of the schedule? <clears throat> Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the school board meeting schedule as published? I would move to approve the school board schedule as published. Okay. Is there a second? Ms. Pat, second. Okay. My only question is, um, do we need to add October, November, because a new board would not go into session until mid-November. Are you and Jeremy up for election this year? No. I thought we had consistency for like at least a full year. 2021. 2021. Jeremy and I are up in 2021. So. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Yeah, so. The November, you could probably put the October one in here. We could add that one now. November one, we're going to have to wait until the election, and then you have to wait a week after the election to make sure your uh, the county assessor, the county auditor has, and the board of supervisors approved and canvassed the election results. So we often have to move that election one back a week, but we can deal with that later. So if we just add the October. Would the people who made the motion second, would they accept a friendly member to add the second Monday in October as a meeting date? Too? Question. Who, who's up for election? I would be Jeremy and I in oh, 2021. Okay, got it. Okay. It's a year, we're talking a year away, but. A year away. That's going to say that's quite a ways away. Okay. But the, the thing of it is, is in the past, we went September to September. Now we're going November to November. Okay. I move to accept the amendment. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay, That's a friendly second. amendment. Don't need to. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All in favor. Any other further discussion? Otherwise, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. Uh, next on the agenda are. Uh, policy employee conflict of interest, Mrs. Treba. So both of these um, first readings are due to the FEMA grant that we received. There are policy changes we need to have in writing to accommodate the requirements of our FEMA grant. So um, I would recommend approval of this first reading for conflict of interest as it is stated. Pat, they wanted more federal the writing. They wanted more federal writing in these policies. Um, what we had in there wasn't wasn't good enough for their standards for the grants. Um, no, I talked to ISP, and um, they're in the middle of making these policy changes, so they're a little they're worded better for our schools. Um, we'll just go back and adjust those after they're done. So. I'm sorry. Comments, questions, concerns from our board. Hearing none, is there a motion to approve 
Code number 401.3. This is Pat. I move to accept the first reading of code number 401.3. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay. It's been moved by Ms. Stevens, seconded by Dr. Nystrom to approve the first reading of uh, code number 401.3. Any further discussion? Hearing none. <clears throat> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. <clears throat> First reading does pass. Next, we have board policy number 705. Uh, point one R2. And I'll entertain a motion on this one. I move, to, motion, I move to approve policy 705.1R2, purchasing federal requirements first reading. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, it has been moved to, and seconded to approve uh, board policy 705.1R2, uh, addendum first reading. Is there any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The motion passes unanimously. We will now move on to broad reporting policy. Um, and I'll turn this over to Ms. Tripa too. So this is similar. Uh, we needed to change our language to match the requirements of the FEMA grant. The difference between this one and the one that's coming up after is that they do not have to be a board policy. They, so they do not require two readings. Um, it is simply um, one time approval. Any discussion questions from board members? Again, this is something that the School Board Association is working on. We don't see any big problems with compliance to it right now. Correct. <clears throat> okay. Okay, is there a motion to approve? Joy, is there a motion to approve? Pam moves, or Pam moves to approve the fraud reporting policy sure. as FEMA request. Okay. Is there a second? Do I hear a second from Mr. Weber? Yes. Okay. Okay. It's been moved by Dr. Nystrom, seconded by Mr. Weber to approve the fraud reporting policy as presented. Any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Opposed? Nay. The motion passes unanimously. We now go to the personally identify information policy. <clears throat> Mrs. Tripa. Same situation. We <clears throat> changed the language to match what FEMA was requiring as part of our FEMA grant. Um, again, we checked with IASB and they are also working on that as well, but we see no um, foreseeable problems. Um, this is also not a policy change, so it is a one-time approving um, situation. Okay, questions from board members, discussion. Hearing no further discussion, is there a motion to approve the personal, personally identified information policy? This is Pat, I move to accept. Okay, it's been moved, is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved by Ms. Mrs. Stevens, seconded by Mr. Pritchard to approve the personally identified po information policy, revisions as presented. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. <clears throat> Motion passes unanimously. 
Next we have on the agenda is the IASB legislative resolutions. Uh, for the board members who are new, what happens every year in July, we get a statement from the Iowa uh, School Board Association about what their lobbying efforts are going to be for the coming school year. More specifically for January, but they get their policies and everything started. Now, we look at these in July at this meeting. We then I encourage the board members to <clears throat> take them home, scan through them, and come up with about your list of your top oh, four issues. The four things you think the Iowa Association School Board should be lobbying our state legislature for the most in the coming legislative session. At our meeting in August, we'll come back. Everyone will give their top four list and we will see how the vote comes out and hopefully we'll be able to come up with a policy and then we have to recommend, I think it's by August 15th or something, we have to send those responses into the Iowa IASP. <clears throat> so I'll start with a discussion for main board members if they looked at them and they already got their top four picked out, great. I'll take anyone that's got their top two. Uh -huh. Okay, so I guess we have some homework. All of us have some homework for the next month. Go through those, write down your top four, and uh, we'll get together. Maybe we can have a whiteboard in here at our next meeting so we can uh, have uh, Mitch be able to write down who's voting for what, and then we can. Um, Come up with a consensus. So, okay. Okay. So, just to clarify, as I look through all of this, are we discussing? Are we out of the blue headers or the sub numbered stuff? Oh, the numbers. It starts the on numbers. page Perfect. eleven. Perfect. That it's, the is it the res it's the resolutions, I believe, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And these resolutions will also be voted on. The reason we start now is that um, when we go to the State School Board Association meeting, if and when they have it, or else they'll have it <coughs> by um, Zoom, like everything else, All each school district gets a vote based on the size of their school. There's one representative from each school district that sits at it. Last year, I did it uh, because the rest of you were sitting in a uh, new board orientation. Um, if someone else would love to have the honor in it this year. You've already appointed me, Brian. Well, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. So we need, this is information that Pat will need to have. Uh, so that, um, she can speak for our district if there anything comes up. So page 12 through 16, there's 30 of them here. Let's see, I'll come up with the top four. Okay. okay. So I got my agenda out here. Oh, the return to learn policy. I'm sure this is set in stone right now. I kind of doubt it. Um, Mr. Trepo, we're going to ask you to kind of summarize our return to learn policy as it stands right now on July 13th at 724 p.m. Because I'm sure it will change yes. by July 15th at the same time. Yes. So I believe it's been two weeks since you last met as they were <clears throat> and discussed the return to learn plan. And so within the last two weeks, um, I had the opportunity to attend um, the board, Boone County Board of Health meeting, as well as um, we have received more information from other organizations, um, such as um, the American Academy of Pediatricians, as well as uh, the Superintendents Association, um, National Education Association, other organizations that have 
um, shared what they view to be some of the safe ways to open up school. And um, at the Boone County Board of Health meeting, um, it was shared that the recommendation is that we require masks of both adults and students and that um, as applicable with regard to the students as there will be some situations where we um, may not be a mask, it may be a face shield um, to accommodate some of the medical um, needs. We may also have uh, teachers in face shields in terms of for, um, when they're teaching vocabulary or they're having to communicate um, obviously with face shields, that can be a little bit easier than with a face mask, but uh, the recommendation of the district would be to follow the Boone County Board of Health as well as the American Academy of um, Pediatricians recommendation of, of face masks. We also in the last two weeks have had um, time administratively to try and measure our classrooms because the recommendation, obviously the ideal setting would be six feet but the American Academy of Pediatricians had um, also shared that um, if there are face coverings being utilized, that three feet um, would be the minimum space that we would need to have between our students. So we did measure classrooms to see which classrooms we could accommodate that and still be on site with all students, which classrooms um, that was not possible. We looked at the current furniture that we have in each of the classrooms because in um, some cases, the furniture that we have does not lend itself to the three foot, um, three to six foot um, spacing that we're looking for. Um, for example, we have tables in some of our classrooms and so um, that does not allow us to have that kind of spacing that we'd like to see. So um, that's something that we have been discussing as to how we might be able to accommodate and um, maybe alter schedules to determine how to have social distancing occurring. We've also looked at our lunchroom capacity as um, the recommendation is to be at least 50% at the same time wanting us to um, have our students in cohorts. So whichever would be the lesser is would be our goal for the lunchroom um, as far as um, the numbers of students in the cafeterias. And then um, in the last two weeks, we had been finalizing our extended school year programming, which starts July 20th. And so um, that will be the beginning of us um, introducing the face coverings to our staff and students. So they will be utilizing face coverings during the extended school year. Um, we do have them spread out among four buildings um, to also um, minimize and um, maximize the cohorting and minimize the uh, chances that if there happened to be a situation where students needed to um, not be in school for 14 days, that it would not um, cause our extent, entire extended school year to um, not meet. So those are some of the things that we've done um, with regard to um, our extended school year. So as we looked at um, trying to determine a hybrid uh, concept. We had explored a couple of different ideas, one being an AM or a PM situation where maybe half the students came in the AM, half came in the PM. And we also um, ex are exploring a, students would attend for two days, have a day where our teachers would pr be provided some professional development and allow our teachers to help those students online that need assistance and then two days of um, online, and then the other half of the students would be in person. So two days on a day of assistance and two days off. We would divide it by families where we would have, um, so that families would have the same schedule. So we do it alphabetically, um, but that's kind of where we are right now is in the brainstorming phase. We have not decided anything yet. In fact, we had sent out a survey, not just to our parents. The last time we met, that had not been done. We did send out a, a survey to parents to find out um, where they, where their perspective was with regard to the different topics. And we had a really nice turnout with sur the survey. It was 1,022 um, people responded to that survey. 
Um, we did send a survey out to our staff as well. We've had, the last time I looked, it was 255 um, responses to the staff survey. And so before we come up with an actual rough draft of on-site and hybrid um, plans, we need to reconvene with staff members after having the first set of feedback so that we can hopefully come back to the board on the 21st with a rough draft. And then um, our goal would be to send a rough draft out to the community um, for parents and staff to provide further feedback before we make a final determination in August as to what our recommendation of how we will actually return to, to learn um, in the fall. And the reason to wait till August is because as you know, um, things have changed dramatically even in the last two weeks since the last board meeting. And we wanna make sure that we're um, making an informed decision with the latest data that we can. And we're hoping that by providing the rough draft to our parents and staff it, next week, that we would be able to at least give them an idea of how to plan um, for one of those three plans. And then um, make sure that we have as much feedback from our stakeholders as possible so that we are meeting the needs of our, of our community. The other thing that we've been working on, we'll continue to work on is providing an online option for those that um, are not able to attend in person. So that's something that we are looking at um, for a variety of reasons. We do have an online plan that solely online that we already um, shared in the Torridor Times, but as unfortunately, we will probably be tasked with students who have to quarantine at home for 14 days, even if it was um, an exposure and they're feeling fine, um, depending on what public health might recommend to them. We need an option for our students to be in person, go online and then back in person as seamlessly as possible. So um, we will have an online option for those in that situation and hopefully um, one for those that do not feel that they can medically um, attend um, in person at this time. Thank you, Ms. Tripa, for that uh, brief summary. Let me just say, make a couple statements here. Um, some of you may know, um, some of you don't. Um, I'm also the chairman of the County Board of Health. In the Board of Health, uh, we had our longest meeting since I've been chairman for seven or eight years debating this. Um, policy the Board of Health approved for Boone County is basically the same one that was approved for Story County. Story County, uh, their chairman of their Board of Health is a senior pediatrician over there in Ames. And I, we did, two of us did talk and tried to have things the same between the two counties as much as possible. Uh, the other statement I'd like to make is that this is not this is not a political Republican versus Democrat issue. If you really want to know American Academy of Pediatrics, who is the one that I'm putting the most weight behind because that's the big national group of pediatricians and the me medical field is very highly respected, um, much like American Academy of Family Practice, American Medical Association, American College of Physicians, which is the internal medicine group. <clears throat> they came out with a recommendation saying all kids need to be back in the classroom if possible, if possible, way before Mr. Trump or anyone else came out with it. There's a couple concerns. Um, number one is kids are losing their socialization skills because they're not here. Uh, concern number two is a lot of these kids, the only good square meal they get every day is when they're in school. <clears throat> concern number three is um, there are a lot of national experts, including the American County of Pediatrics, that believes that we're missing a lot of cases of child abuse and child neglect. Because in the past, all kids had, 98% of the kids came to school every day and the teachers saw them, had eyes on them. And the teachers could they suspected something. Technically, teachers are mandatory reporters, but they could also go up to the teacher or send the teacher to the guidance office, principal's office, and prevent further abuse. And when these kids are at home all the time, they're just not getting that. So those were some of the main reasons behind 
the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations. They feel masks are strongly, strongly recommended for all the kids when possible. Some kindergarten through say second graders may have problems uh, with them on their face. For that reason, I would encourage parents who are listening tonight. And um, if you have a grandchild, have your kids, your elementary age kids, start wearing a mask around the house for an hour or so. Make it a fun game or something. So your kids actually get used to wearing those masks for an hour, start with an hour and then maybe a couple hours after a week. So then get up to wearing them three or four hours. Now they're not gonna have them on all the time, probably when they're out at recess, it's gonna be pretty tough to keep them on, but hopefully they're out and about running and not that close to one individual for 15 minutes straight, which is what some of the national criteria say you have to avoid. <clears throat> um, yeah. With that said, the other thing I would say is that uh, an example of a kid who would have to quarantine for 14 days would be if a child's parent <clears throat> picked up COVID-19, let's say they worked at the hospital, or let's say they worked at a meatpacking plant, or let's say they worked at the college and they came home with COVID, then that entire family is in isolation for two weeks time. And no one from that family is supposed to be out of the house and definitely no one from that family would be in school. So that's a, be an example of the 14 days. So the child might be healthy, but there's someone else in the household who is positive. And if we want to try to get this thing stomped out at all, those kids who are in, living in a house where there's someone positive, we need to isolate for 14 days. That's the only way we're going to get that. Our other kids, I think we need to get them out. A couple other things I will say as a physician is that we know that the kids are less likely to transmit the virus to others than our adults. Um, that's kind of the good news. As the viral load, if they have, if they got COVID in and they're asymptomatic, the viral load that is every time they take a breath, how much they're putting out of that virus, it's probably 10, 100 times less than the viral load that an adult asymptomatic person is putting out. So that's probably one of the good things. Uh, on the other hand, we have to recognize that we do have some teachers with some health issues. And for that reason, we need to have the students being wearing masks. The mask is more to protect everyone else from the person with the mask on. Because when I put this mask on, it's mainly to protect someone for, getting COVID for me, if I had COVID and I was in the three or four days, asymptomatic phrase, or I was an asymptomatic carrier. Now, the face shields plus masks or the N95 mask, they do protect the wearer from getting COVID. So those are things we have to look at, but I think bottom line is we need to try to get these kids back in if we can safely do it. Um, and I've gotten some report questions about is this a political issue? And uh, I would say no way to me is this a political issue. I'm looking at the science behind this. When we had our discussion at the Board of Health, there was no talk, Democrat versus Republican or anything. Board of Health members, there's four of us right now. We're all appointed uh, by the County Board of Supervisors. We have no political interest in this. Uh, we just want to do what's best for our kids. And with that, I'm going to open it up to other board members or to administration for comments. This is Pam, Brian. I had the good fortune of listening to the webinar that was presented by the University of Iowa um, Department of Public Health. You might know those people. Those four physicians and Dr. Padati from the governor's office were on a panel and they had some, you know, some very good information. And like you said, only about 5% of the kids get the virus and a lot of them are asymptomatic. And, you know, only a certain number get very, very ill, but some do. But their recommendations, four out of the five of those doctors that spoke, their recommendations were real consistent. Um, 
you know, masks or face shields as can be managed and to reassure parents that there's only a real limited number of reasons why a person couldn't wear a mask. And Dr. Edmund basically said, people in construction and in industry and the medical community have worn them for years and years. And it's people that have chronic heart conditions and, and rep you know, respiratory conditions that have difficulty wearing them. And young kids and kids with challenges. So, you know, they were real consistent in that. They were real <clears> consistent <throat> in the six foot distancing guideline. They were real consistent in cohorts, smaller cohorts of students. Um, you know, these people were experts, not just in public health and epidemiology, but, you know, one represented pulmonary and critical ill patients, one represented kids. They, they also had, you know, very good credentials. And their bottom line was listen to your local health department. And I was really glad to hear that because we've got to put our trust in you guys. I'm glad you're working with Dr. Passion. Um, I think we, you know, they, they had great ideas for bathrooms. They had great ideas for very little movement of cohorts around the building. They had, you know, lots of good recommendations because the bottom line is to keep kids healthy because they pass it to adults and keep our teachers healthy. I, you know, if anybody wants to read my notes, I sent all the board members copies. Anyone's welcome to them. Jill has good notes too. And then the woman who coordinated things from the University of Iowa sent us all slides. I believe uh, Lisa Cook sat in on it too, but it was very helpful. And I think we need to listen to those people because, you know, like you, Brian, they, they're the experts. Um, they talked about getting kids back. I mean, they all want kids to get back. And so that's, you know, a lot to consider. There's a lot to consider. And correspondence from staff <clears throat> is, you know, interesting. There are a lot of, I don't know, I'll say there are some teachers who are really concerned because they, if they get sick, they don't want to bring it home because they live with people who are fragile or they have health conditions. So the more information we have, I, I do believe the more information we have, the better. And they stress getting parents, like you said, get parents ready for this because school isn't probably going to look like school looks and i think we need to be open-minded um this isn't like you said a political issue this is more of a moral issue in the last week there were four thousand new somehow I lost pam we all lost pam yep. uh, temporarily Hopefully Bob can get her back on. Yep. I, uh, I, have, I have a few thoughts. Um, I wait for her to come back. Um, go ahead while waiting for her to come back. Joy, go ahead. Go ahead while we're waiting for Pam to come back. Well, first off, like we we all as a board had a teacher email us today. And I don't know if everyone had a chance to read through that, but it was it was, it, 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 it made me weep. It really did. Just, it was a perspective that I hadn't even thought through. Like I've thought through the fact of we need to protect our students. And I've thought through the fact of we need to protect our teachers and trying to balance that out. And, and then I've never even thought about the fact of like, our teachers are, are dealing with, they need to protect themselves, but they know that they are on the front lines of educating our children and, and caring for our children and all the things that Brian talked about, like they understand the weight of all of this. And so like, as much as I feel it as a school board member, hands down, these, these teachers, these associates, these bus drivers, lunchrooms, administrators, you guys are, are on the front lines of it. And, and so I'm just, 
so thankful for you guys and yeah i just i just want to thank you guys for that um a lot of stuff that i i think through as we talk through i mean just some, maybe some questions and and they're just don't need to be answered tonight just as we think through it um what does sports look like in the fall maybe that's a question for brett maybe he knows that already um maybe not i don't expect an answer brett i, I really don't um um as Julie is, um, are, are we for sure gonna have an online option for all of our students? Or is that just for a certain amount? Because those are questions I've already been receiving as a school board member. Um, teachers pay, you know, as we talk about, you know, if a teacher comes into contact with someone with COVID, or, or even they potentially have COVID and have to take 14 days off, are we gonna require them to use up all of their sick time and vacation? Or are we just gonna pay them to take those 14 days off? Um, and then even this one maybe isn't even that important, but just I saw this thing on Facebook, whatever that means um, of, you know, cause we were talking about maybe the face shields for those with literacy um, and so maybe Brian, you can answer this one. I saw uh, an ad for a, uh, a face mask with a shield built into it. Um, I don't know if that helps and is viable. Yeah, lots of thoughts and questions and things. <clears throat> West Des Moines is, is in addition to face masks also requiring all the teachers to wear the face shields. Um, and I, I think that's not a bad idea. Again, if it's, if it's going to protect our teachers more, it's something we should be considering as well. The um, face shield issue is one that um, here in Boone County we've uh, debated about. Some um, of the, our providers and some of our nursing staff are using those instead. University of Iowa is one of the big, biggest proponents of face shields instead of masks, to be honest with you. Um, <clears throat> I have... Um, Joel, you were saying about the um, saran wrap type mask or with a clear covering. I have seen those. I've had, had a um, uh, death interpreter come in and she had a mask like that where uh, probably a three by five area was basically a firm plastic and then there was paper around the edges like a regular mask. And she said those are available. So that's another option. Um, using both mask and face shield. That is something that we do do in the hospital or in the offices anytime we suspect a COVID-19 patient. We will put both our um, masks on and our face shields. Um, so those face shields are an option. Um, you know, one time we were picking them up for about, the hospital was getting them for about three to five dollars a face shield. Um, and they've been modified and improved since the ones we got initially, which aren't the most comfortable things. That's why we don't wear them all the time. But there's some that are more comfortable that are out there we may have to look at. Um, this is a floating moving target. Sports, I'm gonna let Mr. Collins give a couple words here in a second. But I will say that um, if you're interested, a uh, gentleman by the name of Jeff Linder, who work, has worked for the Cedar Rapids Gazette for since about 2000, no, 97, 1997, 98. He wrote an editorial, he's their main high school sports beat writer, suggesting that possibly exchanging the fall and spring athletic seasons. That is doing um, soccer um, and track and golf and tennis in the fall, that is sports that are a lot less um, contact. And then in the spring, going with football schedules. There's a couple of colleges, I believe the Pioneer League out east is already doing that type of thing. So I think it's a fluid area. I don't know when that we're gonna have the two associations come up with a firm statement. Um, I'm gonna ask Mr. Collins to speak next. Yeah, just some updates from me. Um, we just actually received a, a message um, from the 
the union and the association together um, to all ADs saying that they were working diligently on further guidance from the fall. Uh, as of right now, they're still planning on practices beginning August 10th, um, but they were looking at, uh, which, which is what the typical um, schedule is, the, the projected schedule before all of this happened. Um, um, but they're also, you know, trying to wait for Department of Ed and County Health Departments um, to kind of make their move, so to speak. Um, I know a lot of districts are discussing return to learn plans and that they uh, are very diverse in nature um, and that may have an impact on things. Um, currently, um, I can tell you that I've been very, very pleased with um, how we've been able to get through our summer sports. Um, right now, it's very random how it's affecting uh, teams. Um, I think there's a couple more that went down today that can't finish their season. Um, we're trying to do our due diligence and, and make sure that we're able to finish out ours. Um, our girls have a scrimmage to, uh, tomorrow night and then they play in their regional game at Ballard on Thursday. So we're getting closer for them. And then our boys are at Hampton tonight, host winter set tomorrow night, and then we will host the first two rounds um, for district baseball. Um, with that comes some added stress, but I, I think the association took a very good step. Um, although we didn't, weren't completely aware of it, um, they went away from double headers um, for the first round. So we will only host one game instead of two, which I think helps with the social distancing. It helps with the sanitizing of dugouts and bleachers um, to just have those home sites. Um, you know, we're having, we're having some of those open gym, we're spraying down the weight room, we're doing what we can, but obviously we can't um, cover everything. And I think uh, decisions from school districts as to what plans are going to happen um, academically will have a strong impact on what we're able to do with athletics. Um, you know, I'm interested to know, um, I think we're all just sitting waiting and, and as to what we can and can't do and how how decisions from districts will affect um, what we can do. As far as the, I've, I'm also hearing a lot of the flipping of schedules, um, you know, whether it be on Twitter or Facebook or, um, you know, local personalities that have their opinions on um, flipping fall to spring and spring to fall. Um, that's a, it's a good idea in theory. Um, I will tell you from an AD's point of view, <laughs> if we were doing that, I would have liked to have done, uh, made that decision about a month ago um, as far as for preparation for the season. But hey, we'll do what we have to do um, in order for our kids to participate. Um, I just know with, the, uh, with more and more schools um, going down with the current guidelines, if one, one student, one student athlete gets a positive case, and the whole team has to go into quarantine, um, that will have a strong impact, especially on some of the ones in the fall, uh, some of the sports in the fall that where there is a higher population of kids involved and there's more contact in some of those sports. Um, but then again, I see a couple today where it's all based on county health and what their um, interpretation of things are too. There's a couple that are still moving forward um, and so in, in other places of the state. So that's kind of where we are. Um, from my point of view of things, so. Uh, let me just say this. I just got a text message saying that um, the conference the DMAC is in, they are planning on, um, apparently it's on the 6 o'clock news tonight, their fall contact sports, i.e. football, soccer, and volleyball will be played in the spring. Yeah. The basketball season been moved to January to March. I think yeah, volleyball has also today. been moved in spring. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Football, basketball, and volleyball have all been moved to yep. spring. So uh, this is fluid, even as we're talking here tonight. Um, Can I share something about um, one of the questions Joey had about staff? If they happen to be gone for COVID-related illness, I can answer that question now. In fact, I believe that Boone even passed the resolution last spring. The CARES Act um, actually accommodates individuals that may be diagnosed with COVID or have to care for someone with COVID um, for two weeks paid leave. That's in addition to the leave that the district would have for their staff members. So um, to answer that question, they would have that opportunity um, after that first two weeks though, then that would um, be tied into the leave um, practices that we currently have as a district. 
Thank you, Julie. I do, I do remember voting with that, but yeah, just it's always helpful to be reminded and for this to be on public record. So thank you. Yeah, I also address one of Joey's questions. Joey yes, asked Mrs. About, James. Okay, Joey asked about um, options for online learning. And I know that Mrs. Trepp and I talked to, uh, earlier today about you know, some of the legalities and the things that we're working through to make sure that we can provide those options. But I also spent about an hour with Bob Patterson, our director of technology today, talking through what do we have for technology? We know that there may be some additional things we'd like to have to be able to do you know, some online and, and remote learning better, um, but we may not be able to get that technology instantly. So how will we make sure that we can be prepare, prepared you know, to provide for um, families and students in August. We talked through what we currently have um, that we could make use of to make sure that we could meet those needs. And he feels pretty confident that we would be able to meet the needs um, of our, our families and students if we needed to with what we have. Um, and also talk through some options for, um, we wanna make sure that we can support our teachers that you know, just because our, our teachers are in the classroom, but there may be a family or students who have to be at home, um, that's kind of doing double duty as a teacher to serve your kids face to face as well as those that are home. And so we have some teacher leaders we've tasked with helping um, kind of brainstorm how will we manage that and what are some things we can do. Um, they've kind of put their heads together and are coming up with some ideas, some ways to support teachers in that. And then Mr. Patterson and I discussed what different technologies could we use what uh, subscription, software subscriptions would we wanna use district-wide that would help streamline that and make sure we could support our families. And also what um, options might we have for those families that don't have easy internet access. We know we pr can provide them public access outside our buildings, but are there some other things that we could do? Um, for instance, we talked about, could we do a USB drive with a video on it um, so that there's some instruction for students and not just the worksheet if they were remote. Um, depending on the size of the video, don't quote me that USB may not be our final solution, but he and I talked through some of those options and are continuing to work on that because we wanna make sure that we can provide robust learning for our students if they happen to be at home. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Ms. Jeans. Um, Dr. Nystrom, I think you got back on. Did you have anything else you were and so you were saying 4,000 and then we lost you. I, I can listen to some things and then it goes out. I don't know why I have a poor connection. Bob thinks it's Mediacom, could be. Um, no, I just said there's been 4,000 new cases in a week. So Iowa sure isn't flattening the curve yet. So I agree, this could be different in two weeks. It could look vastly different and that And there she goes. I was gonna throw out. And there uh, she goes again. Um, I will say she said 4,000 new cases the past week. Boom for about the last oh, 10, 12 days. We've been averaging about five new cases confirmed here in Boone County every day. And uh, Story County, they're, they're obviously averaging a few more because they have a larger population, but they're still, <coughs> at high risk um they've been in the top 10 in the nation a few, a few days within the last 30 days for for rates per capita so um it's still here um mrs teban we have not heard from you or mr pritchard chris chris had a comment he wanted to make and while i'm live i mm -hmm. want to say thank you bog for working so much harder during all of these Zoom meetings and you before in a school board session. Just thank you, Bog. You, you did hear from me. I mentioned about the face shields. Okay, um, okay, Jeremy. I, I think I think it's it's going to be tricky. We it's it's we're going to be you know damned if you do and damned if you don't, no matter what. Um, what I'd like to know is, is you know, seeing all the data. We saw some of the data from the, the surveys from the parents, but I, I'd like to see what the data from the teachers are. Are we going to lose any teachers? Um, you know, are there some teachers that won't come back? Um, what does that mean for us? So there's some other data that I think we need to be paying attention to, too, which will happen in the next week or so. Yes, the, the teacher data just was closing tonight at midnight or sometime later, so... Uh, Encouraging any staff watching to log in and do that if, if they have not already. Um, it looks like a majority of our teaching staff, our certified staff, have answered that, but we definitely could hear from more support staff than any of those certified who haven't responded yet. Correct. Jeremy, I'll let you talk. And then, Mr. Byam, you had something? 
and anyone else i'm skimming through here raise your hand right now so i can catch you uh, not much for me i'm just a plumber so i'm gonna have to defer to the experts on most of this stuff i just hope that we place equal emphasis on uh, <clears throat> student safety and staff safety i I know I've, I've heard uh, from some staff about an online option if they are at risk, you know, could they choose to teach remotely if, you know, I don't, I don't know how feasible that is, but if we have a significant portion of our students that are gonna be learning online, could we provide an option to our staff to teach online to, to help protect them? That's one thing that I've heard. So I know that it's being looked into, but I hope that we're paying as much attention to our staff as we are as our students, which I'm, sh I'm sure that we are. Okay. Mr. Byam. I just wanted to say that I think I, I, I genuinely appreciate the, um, over the last six years that I've been in Boone, um, I think one of the things that I've appreciated most is the growth that we've had as a district in the ability to prepare for something like this. Um, when the teachers were able to go to an online uh, version of, of their classes and did it pretty <clears throat> Um, I think one of the things that I've appreciated is the creativity and the ingenu uh, the innovative spirit that we have and, and leading the way as a, as a district. And so I think, um, you know, we've, we've looked at hybrid, we've looked at different opportunities. I think we can, we can think of something uh, with our staff to make sure that we're keeping our kids and our staff safe. Um, I know that uh, this week, Dr. Uh, Osterholm is actually going to give a recommendation on some um, uh, for schools uh, to give. An, it, he's going to give a recommendation. Uh, my my stepdad is also a, a physician, and he's been keeping track of kind of what's going on. And so, I think one of the things looking at like my data from my staff, I did reach out to my staff, and there are some concerns where you're going to have staff members that are definitely going to have to isolate themselves from their own family. And that's scary for me. Um, obviously, it's scary for my staff. And so I think one of the things that I continue to challenge my staff on at, when we're looking at our students is we have to have Maslow before we can have Blooms. So we have to have our basic needs met and our safety met before we can do a really great job of educating our students. And so I think we're tasked <clears> at <throat> finding those solutions that can help ease the burden on our on our staff um, and on our community. So, uh, I think I have a lot of faith in what we're doing. I have a lot of faith in the people that um, you know are surrounding us, and I think we can we can make the right decisions there. Okay. Thank you very much. It's been a very interesting discussion. I will say, uh, Mr. Byam, uh, Dr. Olsterholm. He is another one of the experts nationwide that I think a lot of people listen to. Uh, he is an epidemiologist uh, up for, I believe he works for the state of Minnesota now or for the University of Minnesota. One time he was at um, Mayo Clinic's, um, been in this business a long time and uh, he's someone that everyone listens to. Um, I'll be interested to hear what he has to say about uh, going back to school. Um, I agree with that. Again, this is an ever-changing policy and we're not really approving a whole lot tonight because anything we'd approve we'd be changing I know that I believe the board has a meeting next Monday night and so I'm sure this issue issue will come up again people have questions concerns um, I encourage you to email our board members um, call us um, send us a letter um, with your concerns we'll try to answer them as we can. Um, some questions we just can't answer right now. It's going to be, we're going to have to wait until August 22nd. Unfortunately, I say that only half joking because things are going to be changing that fast. So with that, I'm going to move on to the superintendent's report. Okay, I don't have a whole lot for the superintendent's report because it's my time has been um, pretty well spent working on return to learn and trying to uh, maneuver my way through some of those um, obstacles that keep coming up. So I uh, probably just let you know that I've been meeting with community members and staff, um, trying to get familiar with those in the community and, 
and um, making sure people know that I am here and, and how to reach out to me. I would also encourage anyone watching, um, in addition to sharing your thoughts with the board to please keep a close eye on the surveys that we send out and to please respond to those because we really are paying very close attention to those surveys. We will be having follow-up surveys coming out um, that will be even more specific um, because uh, in order to make informed decisions, we need people to give us feedback. So I wanna thank everyone that did provide feedback, um, but encourage you to, to um, continue to look for those as well. I also um, had a meeting last Friday um, where Mitch and I had uh, a meeting in, at ISFIS with the Grunmeyer search firm that um, performed the search um, when I went through the interview process and they um, had a whole day set aside for Mitch and I to go through the financial state of the district and then to review if you recall, those of you on the board would uh, be familiar with the survey that I had to take as a part of the hiring process. Um, Mitch had to take that as well so that we could look at um, the dynamics that exist with regard to each of our strengths and maybe the areas where we can support one another. And I am in talks with um, one of those members to see what it would um, cost us to provide that same opportunity to our admin team and to central office because I think um, you're better when you can build off of one another's strengths. And it was a very unique survey. It's one that I've not done before any of the leadership surveys. Um, those administrators that are watching, I think have probably done the strengths training um, surveys and, and such that kind of help you know what your strengths are. But this, uh, the one that Grunmeyer uh, uses is unique because it has three separate surveys that help you better identify um, just kind of just your strength areas and, and how you think and how you interact with with people. So that I thought that was a really good um, day, um, well spent and very productive. So I'm hoping that we can bring that back um, to our, our administrative team who can then maybe share some similar um, processes with their own staff. Um, our SFM is an insurance company that um, we brought on to help with workers' compensation. And their sole purpose is to discuss plans on how to make uh, Boone a safer place to be an employee. And I had joked, I think I had sent all of the board and, and some of the staff members the joke that I can't wait to bring the um, penguin shuffle to Boone but that would be something that is one of the strategies to help us keep from falling and slipping on icy sidewalks. And, and, um, and it's something that actually is a fun way to make things safe. And I think that once we have an opportunity to share these strategies with our staff, um, it does make you feel better about being in a district that cares enough to, to take steps to make you safer. So I'm excited to be working with them as well. And then tomorrow, um, the Department of Education is going to be providing more information and more guidance with regard to special education on return to learn plans as we go through this process. So um, we've said it numerous times that things keep changing. And while we've had previous guidance, we're going to get more guidance on, on tomorrow's webinar. And then there should be another webinar on Thursday as well. And I'm not sure if that'll be a continuation of special education or if they'll hit another topic yet. But um, we will stay adept to at that. We will also be sharing, um, just as we did with our parent survey, um, sharing the staff survey information as well. I think it's really important to be very transparent whenever we ask for feedback that we share the feedback we receive so people know how um, we're basing our decisions and, and what information we're using. So that is something that we will continue to do is share the feedback that we receive um, with our stakeholders. So um, that's all I have for my report today. Okay, thank you very much. And Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, this is Mrs. Julie Treva. She's our new superintendent of schools. Seems like she's been with us forever. We hired her back in late January before all the COVID. So we're able to do personal interviews and she has been uh, slowly 
getting involved since uh, she moved to our community in June. I encourage everyone to stop by and say hello to her from six feet away or with your mask on. And I'd like to welcome her and her husband, Tim, to town officially. With that said, uh, we are going to uh, adjourn the regular quick, part quick of question, meeting. Quick question, if I, if I could ask one. Just curious how we're looking in terms of resignations versus new hiring, how that process is going, and if we're looking like we'll be full staffed when school starts this fall. Mr. Byam, I think we're just missing a Spanish teacher, right? Yes. We are missing a Spanish teacher. Uh, we missed out on a really quality one. Um, we got a resignation about a week and a half um, after uh, one of our candidates that I had met at Iowa State. Um, she accepted a job and signed a contract before I could get to her. I got the, uh, and then we haven't had many applicants. So we're trying to put some solutions together and hopefully uh, we can get some answers here in the next week or two. My answer, Jeremy, is right now, I think we'll be okay, but <laughs> we'll see what the next few weeks bring. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from any other board members before we, we have a executive session we have to do yet for board members, um, you know, Ms. Trupa and Mitch. Okay. We're going to take a five minute break so Bob can get us switched over and we'll go from there. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening tonight. Just verifying, we are going to the different sites.